Hello once again, it's us. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast. My name's Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me as always, well, actually, he's not there now, <laughs> Professor Fred Watson, yes, astronomer at large. I was just introducing you when you walked away. <laughs> is all well? It's Yuri's day today. Yes, I knew that. <laughs> he, he knew it, but I didn't. Okay, good. Yes, yeah, that's right. With the 60th, that's absolutely right. Yes. Mm. Uh, see, see how professional we are. We've started <laughs> perfectly today. Perfectly. <laughs> Hello, Marnie. I, Ma Marnie can't hear you because I've got the headphones in. That's okay. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I can't. Uh, Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Somebody actually asked the other day if we could get you on the podcast again because they they um, they like the Dark Skies project and and everything you do. And I said, well, you know, this was Misty West over in the United States. And I said, well, actually, you know, we should get her on again. So there she is. Hello. Say hello to Misty. <laughs> hello, everybody. Happy Dark Sky <laughs> Week. Last day of Dark Sky Week. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a huge week, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, yeah. and of course, Yuri's Day refers to Yuri Gagarin because uh, today's the anniversary. Uh, it is the 12th of April that we're recording this, uh, that he uh, made his um, epic journey into space. He was up there for, what was it, 108 minutes or something? Yeah, that was all? Bit. Yeah. And he would have uh, seen but... a lot less light pollution from space than the astronauts <laughs> he... see today. So. Yes, I, I can imagine. On that happy so, note, but... I'll leave you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Marnie. Thank you. So after that um, rather unusual start, we introduce <laughs> Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hi, Hi Andrew. Oh, well, we are so professional, I'm glad... aren't we? It's just... <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a ripper. It's an absolute ripper. Uh, but I'm glad she. I'm glad Marnie came in and, and reminded me of that yeah. because I did. I did talk about it on my radio show this morning about Good. Yuri Gagarin's uh, epic flight. And uh, yes, 1961, 1961. wasn't it? 1961. And you know, that was one of the things that um, I was still at school then and thinking, what shall I do with my life? Ah, I know. Mm. <laughs> there was an that eclipse. Was it, was that the yeah, there was an eclipse in the February and I thought, yeah, I think this is going to be my career. But when Yuri went into space, that just clinched it, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of was uh, a wake up call for the United States yeah, because yeah. I know they were toying with the idea of space travel, but um, having the Russians get up there at such a tense time between the two countries kind of went, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to do something about yeah, this. That's, that's and right, it? it all began. Yeah. Mm. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, such a, a, a sad end to his, just an incredible um, achievement when um, uh, when he died too. He, um, he, uh, you would think doing something as dangerous as going into orbit for the first time would probably put you on the brink of uh, some untimely death, but uh, it all went awry on the ground basically. Did he? Um, did, did he not die in an air crash? Like, I think it was an air crash. Yeah, yeah I mean yeah. on. Yeah, it was um, it was a very uh, I think uh, they've done an inquest that has since suggested that his death was attributed to um, turbulence from another oh, really? aircraft. Ooh. Yeah. So that's that's the way I read it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, he will never be forgotten for what mm -hmm. he achieved 60 years ago. So um, yeah, it's Yuri's day today, the 12th of April. Now, Fred, um, after that quite uh, straight down the line beginning to the the program episode 248 uh we're going to just have a quick word about ingenuity because uh, that's just about to happen and may well have happened by the time you hear this uh we're also going to uh, analyze um, some particle physics uh, because it, it's possible we've got the universal model wrong possible uh, some new findings about the aurora of Jupiter and some audience questions from Richard in Brisbane and Tom in Toronto, Canada. I know they hate it when I say that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll do all that. Uh, but let's uh, talk about ingenuity again. We've been talking about it every week for the last few weeks, but that's because uh, it's starting to really get close to this um, this uh, uh, impending launch of a helicopter on Mars and hopefully hopefully by the time this uh, podcast is out there in the ether it will have happened and been successful yeah we hope so um the the, the news we have as of today is that uh, a test um 
I think a couple of days ago um, to uh, test fly the, the rotor was aborted by the um, the uh, helicopter's onboard computer. Which oh. said, nah, don't like it. Uh, it, it. It was as they were trying to rev up their, uh, you know, the, these rotors go around at 2,400 RPM so they, they, they can bite the Martian, the thin Martian atmosphere. Um, mm. And it was while that was happening that this computer detected s some kind of uh, issue, um, which was not necessarily a problem, but I think there's something called a watchdog timer that shut the thing down because of a potential problem. Uh, and so presumably there'll be uh, lots and lots of, um, you know, lots and lots of um, uh, 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 post-mortems about that to find out what it was. But as, as far as we know, the first flight is now rescheduled to Wednesday this week, uh, which means that mm -hmm. that'll probably be Thursday our time uh, here in Australia. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're listening to this and it's happened, that's fantastic. And I hope the news is good and we'll report on it next week, probably. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, it's, um, we, we've had to record early this week because of uh, impending travels. So, um, yeah, we, we couldn't wait until the, uh, the actual event before we could record. But, uh, yeah, hopefully everything went swimmingly. Uh, although if something goes wrong, they can't ditch on Mars because there's nothing to land in <laughs> as far as water's concerned. But uh, yes, fingers crossed for uh, for Ingenuity's inaugural flight, which uh, it's got so many people excited. It's uh, getting a lot of chatter across social media on uh, some of the astronomical and space Facebook pages and uh, Instagram uh, pages and, and so on and and the news I mean you just you put ingenuity into your search engine and press the news button you just get this list and list long lists of stories so yeah it, and, and it is um, quite a uh, an astonishing piece of ingenuity uh, if they pull it off and I'm I'm very confident they will and very hopeful uh, right let's move on to our uh, next story Fred and this this is a about some experiments that have been done, uh, some dating back some decade and a half in regard to a, sub a subatomic partic particle called a muon. Uh, and, and this sort of tells the story of um, the, the way this particular particle has been behaving, which has got a few people scratching their heads because it's not doing what they thought it should do. And that's led to some speculation that we might have the model of the universe wrong. And they've uh, just released some new data as at this month, the 7th of April, that um, puts a little bit more weight behind what might be happening and whether or not we have got the universal model wrong. What, what, what's your take on this? I know you've been following this story. Yeah, that's right. So the, the bottom line uh, is that uh, for some time, there are two laboratories involved here. Um, one is the uh, the let me get this right, Brookhaven National Robot Laboratory. Uh, mm -hmm. And 15 years ago, they f basically discovered something odd about muons. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, muons are one of the uh, suite of, it's actually 17 subatomic particles. If you, if you don't count the antimatter particles, it goes up quite a bit if you put them in as well. Uh, but the, and of course, they're particles with opposite electrical charge to the normal ones. So yep. uh, the 17 particles, when you include the Higgs boson, um, muons are one of those, that suite of uh, fundamental particles. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're a bit like electrons, but different. They are what are called leptons. That puts them in a category which is different from the quarks, which are, I think, a bit bigger if my understanding is right. But mm. the muons are very important in, and our understanding of them is fairly complete. They come in to the Earth's atmosphere as cosmic rays. That's sort of where the story started, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, in fact, probably more like 80 years ago. So they were behaving in a strange way. Um, and it, and the, 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 the issue is actually to do with the way they behave, behave in magnetic fields, um, the way they move. And it's all about spin and things of that sort. Uh, I've lost the page that I was looking at about all this. I don't know where it is on my screen, uh, so I'm I'm winging this. But uh, the, the 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 real issue now is that uh, Fermilab, which is a high energy laboratory in the United States, have effectively confirmed that original measurement 
that there is something wrong with the with our understanding of the you know the the, the way the muons behave why is that mm -hmm. important just for a start um, it's because uh, if you if you um, look at what we call the standard model which has these 17 particles and the charge and magnetic field are all very 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 well understood as is the strength and an orientation of the magnetic field which is something called the magnetic moment and so you know all those all of those things are well understood but this muon behavior is confounding that and this is why people do particle physics experiments Andrew because what we're really looking for is holes in the standard model things yep. that, that don't fit because we know from observations principally of the universe the astronomy stuff which is why we're talking about this um, we know that there are things that we simply don't understand dark matter and dark energy being the two mm. uh, perhaps the two biggest dark matter is some kind of subatomic particle we believe whose identity is completely unknown um, there were theories called supersymmetry a few years ago that suggested that these were um, particles that fit into this supersymmetric framework um, axions and neutralinos were the two things that were being suggested but there's no evidence that they exist um, until you crack the standard model and find gaps where new physics could creep in you can't invoke these um, wild theoretical ideas because that's all they are yeah. so um, that's why it was exciting and last week there was a news release from Fermilab that said they've confirmed basically confirmed the Brookhaven National Laboratory result that there is something that we don't understand and that gets everybody excited uh, the, st the standard model is you know what what, um, what 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 we're really trying to pull to pieces in a sense mm. and, um, and of course um, when, when physicists uh, particle physicists get excited it goes something like gee look at that Fred <laughs> yeah wow Larry that's pretty incredible <laughs> yeah you probably hit the nail on that <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think astronomers get more excited actually because maybe they, maybe yeah, sometimes yeah. at the telescope they say I used the same joke about um, meteorology the other day but you know <laughs> it's recyclable <laughs> yeah. astronomers say gosh <laughs> <laughs> I say um, that at golf a lot too yeah so that's the exciting bit and I, you know I have to say uh, on my reading of this um, I I thought yeah good on them it's fantastic and so the plan is to do more experiments however mm. um, on I think it was yesterday or the day before 10th of April yeah um, over the weekend uh, essentially a new paper was published um, and I'm not reading that paper I'm actually reading from the conversation article that goes with it um, yep. this is by a group of theoretical physicists now so they're the ones who build the mathematical framework within which these things operate and they have essentially um, looked at the theory again to see whether that's right um, they put they put um, yeah so they, 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 the author of that is a gentleman called Zoltan Fodor who's at Penn State University and he put uh, he put it very very nicely um, in his conversation article uh, when the results of an experiment don't match predictions made by the best theory of the day something is off 15 mm. years ago physicists at Brookhaven National Laboratory discovered something perplexing muons a type of subatomic particle were moving in unexpected ways that didn't match theoretical predictions was the theory wrong was the experiment off or tantalizingly was this evidence of new physics and so what they've done well I'll read on actually because he puts it in in a nutshell physicists have been trying to solve this mystery ever since one group from Fermilab tackled the experimental side and on the 7th of April 2021 released results confirming the original measurements but my colleagues and I took a different approach um, and I'll read on I am a theoretical physicist and the spokesperson and one of two coordinators of the Budapest Marseille Wuppertal collaboration this is a large-scale collaboration of physicists who have been trying to see if the older theoretical prediction was incorrect and we used a new method to calculate how muons interact with mag magnetic fields that's a long quote from the conversation article but it absolutely sums it up what they've done mm. is said well wait a minute 
you know, let okay, the experiment doesn't agree with the theory, and you've checked the experiment by bringing in you know this grand new uh, Fermilab results to the to the table. What about the theory? Uh, is the theory uh, absolutely watertight? And so they uh, this group uh, have re revamped the theory. They've looked at it again. And what they say is my team's theoretical prediction is different from the original theory and matches both the old experimental evidence and the new Fermilab data. If our calculation is correct, it resolves the discrepancy between theory and experiment. Um, it would suggest that there is not an undiscovered force of nature. Ah. So it's a real, a real cold water paper, this, I have to say. But, you know, um, this is what you've got to do uh, when you're probing really what you might call the final secrets of the universe. Things mm. like higher dimensions, all the things that we wonder if we're seeing signs of with the dark matter. When you're doing all that, you've just got to be sure that everything's correct. And certainly this group believe that the theory, the previous theory was wrong and their new theory matches the uh, the results that they're getting. So new physics disappears. I'm sure that there will be much debate in the physics world about this. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of these things that will not be resolved easily. There'll be people taking sides on it and arguing the toss. Um, meanwhile, more experiments will be done and maybe the results will be uh, hardened up. But if it's the theory that's wrong, that's not going to get you anywhere. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're in a kind of stalemate position, Andrew. Uh, I think it's it's very interesting. You know, it's a really exciting piece of uh, physics, but it might not mean yet that we can put our hands on our hearts and say we know what dark matter is because we do. So, what the suggest what the you know the theories were suggesting was that muons were acting inappropriately or just uh, doing weird things that they didn't expect. But now a new paper suggests, oh, hang on a minute they're actually doing what they're supposed to yeah, do. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that throws out my theory that golf balls are made of muons. So <laughs> it must be some other some other subatomic particle that we don't know about yet. Well, they, because they my golf balls act inappropriately quite often. <laughs> But they do have in common, I mean, muons travel at almost the speed of light. I believe yours do as well, isn't that right? <laughs> My golf balls, they barely make 100 miles an hour, which is very sad. Very sad indeed. Mm. No, but I, I think there'll probably be more on this because it's, it's one of those pioneering areas of uh, science and um, astronomy and physics yeah. that they, they're just uh, trying to figure out. And of course, yeah. at, at the top of the tree at the moment, dark matter and dark energy and yeah we're, we're sort of only scratching the surface on surface on figuring all this out you're listening to and watching the space nuts podcast episode 248 with the great fred watson and my good self andrew dunkley space nuts you'll be listening to the space nuts podcast available at apple podcasts google podcasts spotify iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player you can also stream on demand at bytes.com this has been another quality podcast production from bytes.com